Okay, are y'all ready? Yep. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yeah, no, I'm getting no's. All together now, ready? Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Much better. Okay. I'm going to tell you, first I want to show you something. See this right here? It, it's a helicopter, that's right. I've had this longer than I've had my wife. And see, look, <laughs> it still works. Yeah, it's look at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at that. I got this when I was like eight or nine years old. This was one of my favorite toys. I love helicopters. I always have. Helicopters fascinate me. Did you know that helicopters have about 10,000 moving parts, roughly? You can ask the pastor. He can probably tell you better than I can since, since he dealt with aeronautics. But about 10,000 moving parts, and all of them have to work perfect for that helicopter to stay in the air. Okay? I don't have a lot of friends that won't fly in a helicopter because of that. They don't want to take a chance on one part not working and, you know, onto the ground. But So, so 10,000 moving parts... That's pretty amazing. Isn't it amazing that people can make something like that? Amen. Yeah. You know, God made something that has even more moving parts. It has so many parts that we don't even know what they all do. And God made that. And it is so spectacular. I've been studying it for years, and it still fascinates me, even more than helicopters. Do you know what it is? The human body. Good job. Rock on. Fantastic. But we are in the most amazing machine that's ever been made. Is that kind of cool? Mm -hmm. And you know, all those parts that we have that make us up, God still took the time that every machine is different. So throughout all the thousands of years that the earth has been around, up until now, you are different from all the thousands or billions of people who came before us. Is that pretty cool? So do you think maybe you're special? Do you think maybe God chose you to be you? And you know something else that he did? He chose a special something for you to do in your life for him. And it's a mystery that you get to figure out. Doesn't that sound like fun? Do you like mysteries? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, who wants to pray for me? Who wants to pray for me? Okay. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this amazing machine that you made. Thank you for making us. Thank you for making each one of us who we are. Thank you that you have a plan for us and and something for us to do for you to make you come faster. Lord, we want to go home with you and spend time with you in heaven. It's your name that we pray and we love you. Amen. Thank you, brother, for that lively piano music ending this story. And thank you, brother Danny, for the story, letting us know how wonderful our bodies are. Just would like to mention to you this morning that our offering today is for church budget. And I suppose all of you know what church budget is. You have a budget at home, home budget. Church budget is for things around here. And when all of us participate in it, it gives us the opportunity to do some wonderful things here in our church and so I'm going to flip to the next page you had this insert in your bulletins about a little bit about the disaster that happened in the northeast our church does respond to these things we have special parts that we work in with the Red Cross and all of the funds that you send to do the work up there through the church goes to do the work that you'd like to see done it doesn't go to help anybody's salary or something like that. And so when you send money to help there through the church, it gets there to help these people. 
And during this month, while we're thinking about it, all the things that happen up there, look and see what you can take out of your home budget to bring and put into the tithe envelope and mark it for this fund so that we can help the work that's going on up there in the Northeast and the people that are suffering up there as our church is out there delivering the goods right where the rubber meets the road, as we say. And so look at this, plan to come and give an offering for it. That's the only way that the church gets money for this program is through you. And right now the church is hitting you up because of the disaster, just like the Red Cross on TV is hitting you up every day. The church is hitting you up this Sabbath. So bring an offering for this. Going to ask that our ushers stand as we offer, have them wait upon you at this time and as they collect our morning offerings. Thank you. you brother again let's bow our heads in prayer our father which art in heaven we are so thankful that you have entrusted us to be stewards of the things that you have given to us here on this earth lord we're thankful that we have had the privilege of returning a portion of what you have entrusted to us today and Father, we pray that you will take it 
and bless it like you did the fish and the bread on the side of the mountain. And may it spread more and more than what we really gave. We thank you, God, that you can do these things. Multiply it. Be with those who help to make sure that it is multiplied. Guide them and strengthen them. Lord, thank you for trusting us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Satan's manifested things And you feel the urge within you To submit to earthly fears Don't let the faith you're standing in Seem to disappear Praise the Lord full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days 
he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Here ends the reading of God's holy words. Before I do the sermon, I want to talk to you a little bit about this blue bulletin insert. Uh, you know I came from the uh, conference that has some exposure to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, my family and I have had the opportunity to live through two hurricanes. Uh, they both came ashore about 30 miles from the home we lived in. Um, that's kind of a unique experience. But I want to talk to you about this disaster response team. Uh, my daughter is a senior in academy. It was in Mississippi. And the storm literally went over top of Bass Academy. It destroyed Bass Academy. The response team came from Florida, set up this marvelous mobile city, for lack of a better term, it's in the middle, of, it's not really at the edge of the earth, but you can see it from Bass Academy. <laughs> it's in the metropolis of Purvis, Mississippi. No? Okay. It's about 35 minutes south of Hattiesburg. This uh, disaster response team came, set up uh, kitchens, showers, not only for the academy, but the entire community. They sustained the community for about three weeks. Um, another example of how the disaster response team occurs, or helps communities, um, I'm pastoring in a place called Milton, Florida, little community. Hurricane came through and took out a city called Cantonment. It's about 30 minutes north. The disaster response team came and literally saved the city. Uh, it wasn't a big city, so all the other people went to all the big cities. And this little city was out there on its own. The disp uh, disaster response team came and helped all the people. After it was over and everybody was back on the feet, the mayor of the town said, whenever you want to hold an evangelistic campaign, you have the resources of our city, and we will pay for the hall for you to do your evangelism campaign. Amen. Enterprise Alabama. Isn't that really that far from here? We are holding an evangelism campaign. The Baptist figured out it was us, and I'm not exaggerating. They came and shut the series down. Subsequent to that, a few tornadoes came through the town. The disaster response team came fixed the town. The Baptist congregations came, said, we are sorry for what we did that was non-Christian. Please come back and hold your meetings. This will allow us to have an impact not only on the lives that we minister to, but gets the door opened for ministry that might have eternal consequences. Okay? These kinds of things are powerful they are funded through your wallets and purses. Last week we looked at fasting in the Old Testament. If you were here, you'll remember that we found there was only one prescribed fast in the Old Testament. It was associated with the Day of Atonement. But the Jewish people said, hey, this is pretty cool. This works pretty well. Let's see if we can do it in some other instances. And they did. The purpose of the fast was to afflict the soul. And otherwise, it was a way that the Jewish people would work to realign, reaffirm, strengthen their relationship with God. And they did it so their relationship was made to the way God wanted it. 
God isn't really excited about ceremonial fasting where you kind of are just going through the motions. Uh, God's not really excited about fasting if you don't do it his way with repentance and obedience. So we're going to shift now to the New Testament. We're going to see what it has to say about fasting because we're not under the Old Testament system. We are under a different system. And to understand how fasting fits into the 21st century, we're going to look at what Jesus did, what Jesus taught, what his church did in response to what he taught, and one of his apostles and what he did in response to what Jesus said. So we're going to start with Jesus. It's always kind of a good example to follow. Most of you know the story about the 40 days well enough that we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, reading it. You know, he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He was tempted there for 40 days. And as we read in Luke 4, 2, he ate nothing. I like the little ending to that verse and said, at the end, he was hungry. I thought that was kind of nice. So in preparation for this sermon on fasting in the New Testament, I did some reading in a book called Desire of the Ages. That's kind of a neat book I like. And in reference to Jesus' fasting for those 40 days, I want to share with you just one sentence that kind of puts it into context, at least for me. On page 112 of that book, we read, He went to contemplate his mission and his work by fasting and prayer, he was bracing himself for the blood-stained path he must travel. So Jesus engages in an activity in a sense to prepare him for what was to come. Jesus, our example, fasted and prayed so that he was strengthened, braced if you will, to accomplish that which God had sent him here to do. Jesus is a pretty good example to follow. Now, not all examples are worthy to emulate, but Jesus is. Sorry. I remember in ninth grade, that was a long time ago, I was a football player, and our coach was just impressed with the Green Bay Packers. If you know anything about football, they were a good football team back then. I assume they are still. But whatever the Green Bay Packers were doing, our football coach thought that uh, something us ninth graders needed to copy. And believe it or not, I was the right guard. I didn't like being the right guard, but we had to learn new blocking schemes and new plays because that's what the Green Bay Packers were doing. So finally, us rebellious kids said, we don't care what the Green Bay Packers are doing this week, coach, because we just kind of did what we did last week. So we chose not to emulate the Green Bay Packers anymore. But as Christians, I think our leader is a good person to emulate. If he fasts and prays to strengthen himself to be about the business he's supposed to be engaged in, maybe that's something we need to think about. So let's see what Jesus taught his first century church and us about this subject of prayer. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we'll pick up the story in verse 16. You all know Jesus is talking here in Matthew 6, 16. And he says, moreover, when you fast... Do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Amen. Now I want to put those few verses into context for you. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus provides us a discussion about true righteousness. He gives us the theological overview of the kingdom. In chapter 6, he turns from the theoretical to the practical. And he outlines some very specific behaviors that he says members of God's kingdom will be engaged in. 
verses 16 through 18 that I just read was the third specific behavior Jesus is describing that reflects this true righteousness he talked about back in chapter 5. So what we see here in verses 16 through 18 are duties, if you will, of those who are members of God's kingdom. And we do that so that we realign the relationship that may have drifted. We do that in association with prayer, like Jesus did, so that we can be braced, empowered, strengthened to accomplish the task, that mystery, where is Dan? The mystery that God has for each of us uh, to do. So this idea of fasting is really a fundamental aspect of our relationship with God. I want you to look back at verse 16 for a moment. Moreover, when you fast, are Jesus' words. He doesn't say, if you fast, if you think it's a good idea to do. His sentence structure presupposes that you're going to be fasting. Or he wouldn't bother to say that. He thinks followers of him in the 21st century will be engaged in fasting. But he also helps us to understand that there is a right way and there is a wrong way. The hypocrites, if you don't know, are the Pharisees. Jesus and the Pharisees didn't always get along. And he says they're doing it the wrong way for the wrong reason. But you, when you fast, do it the right way, and God will see what you're doing and reward you. So, pretty straightforward statement. Pretty simple if you just take it at face value. But that never seemed to stop the enemy. So flip over to Matthew chapter 9 and we'll get some more clarification because the issue isn't resolved, apparently. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse 14. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. When the disciples of John came to Jesus saying, Why do you and the Pharisees, or we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? We're doing it like the Pharisees. How come you aren't? Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskin breaks and the wine is spilled. John's disciples come and ask for clarification. Are the rules of the game changing? We're doing it like the Pharisees are doing it. Isn't your team going to follow the same rules? Jesus goes, no, don't like those rules. It's not what my father wants. There is a right way and there is a wrong way. Jesus is describing a time when his disciples would indeed fast. But through logic, we can understand there are also times when it's inappropriate to fast, and there are inappropriate ways to fast. Pharisees, if you don't know, thought it would be appropriate, based on their own wisdom and insight, to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. They did that in honor of Moses, who fasted for 40 days. Their fast, Moses' fast, start, sorry, started on a Monday and ended on a Thursday. If it was good enough for the Green Bay Packers, we might as well do it too. You wondered why I told you that Green Bay Packers story, didn't you? See? The Pharisees set up their own rules 
that made sense to them, made logical sense, but it isn't what God wanted. So Jesus says, no, I'm not playing the game by the Green Bay Packer rule. I'm going to do it the way my father wants it done. And if you're my disciples, why don't you follow my example? Now, there are times when Christians need the keenness of thought and insight to deal with a specific issue or a situation in their lives. So fasting and prayer is appropriate. Turn over to Matthew chapter 17. This is the story of the boy that couldn't be healed by the disciples, if you want to put it in context. I'm in Matthew chapter 17. Look with me at verse 20. Well, we'll start in 19, I guess. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, How come we couldn't do that? How come we couldn't cast the spirits out? Verse 20, so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move and from here or there, and it will. Verse 21 is the key. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. There are times when we need special strength. There are times when we need clarity of thought. We need to reconnect in a unique and special way with our power source, God. Prayer and fasting is the mechanism by which we do that. Which is why Brother Dale has been saying some things over the last few days about prayer. Why we have another seminar at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Because sometimes... Prayer and fasting must go together, as Jesus did in the wilderness, as he's talking to the disciples here in chapter 17. So that's kind of an example of the teachings of Jesus. So now let's see what his first century church did. How did they apply the teachings of the master? Turn over to Acts chapter 13. I have to be careful because there are words in here I can't pronounce, so when I skip them, you'll know why. There I can have you guys read it if you'd like. Acts chapter 13, look with me at verse 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, and then there are some names, Barnabas, Simon, all those and some others. Verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and what? Fasted. Fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Fasting as a group as they are ministering to the Lord, or we would say ministering for the Lord. So fasting accompanying with prayer can be done in a group setting, kind of like a church. And we do it so that we are strengthened, embraced for the ministry that God has called us to do. Flip over to chapter 14 for a moment. Look at verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel, verse 21, Acts 14, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to these other places, strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed leaders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Another example of fasting and prayer so that the churches can be about what God has asked them to be about. And it isn't just one church, it says every church engaged in this behavior. So it's not 
a Jewish thing. This is the first century apostolic church. These are Christians. Our forefathers and foremothers were doing what Jesus had instructed them to do. Fasting can be a group activity. A congregation could do it. So now let's tighten it up a little bit and look at just one specific saint, the Apostle Paul, and look at how he views this idea of fasting. I'm in 2 Corinthians, uh, land with me in chapter 6. In my Bible, chapter 6 is, uh, has the title, Marks of the Ministry. I don't know if your Bible has those little subheadings in there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 4. Excuse me. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in much, much patience and tribulation and needs and distress and stripes and imprisonments, in tumults and labors and sleeplessness and fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the words of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil reports and good reports, as deceivers and yet true, and unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastised and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Look at verse 5. What does Paul say is one of the marks of a minister of God? Fasting. And he's not talking about me, by the way. We all are ministers. Okay? It's not like, oh, that's your job, Pastor. Go do that. We'll let you know how it comes out. We'll go, and go have some cake and ice cream. That's not what we're talking about. He's talking about all ministers. All of us can be fasting as Paul did. Okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is this, um, describing suffering for Christ. Okay? I'll just cut to the chase. Look at verse 27. If I can find 11. In weariness... And toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often. Paul, as an example of what it means to be a minister for God, fasted often. He also had sleeping problems, apparently, but that's a sermon for another time. A minister of God that we all, as disciples, have been called to do can follow Paul's example of fasting often. Now, I want you to see that our Savior fasted because he needed to. He told his disciples to fast because he knew they needed to. The first century church put into practice what their master instructed them to do, and Paul, as an individual, said, me too, I'll do it God's way. So now we're in the 21st century. We're too sophisticated for that, right? We don't, that doesn't apply to us. That was back then. For those people, we don't have to do that kind of stuff. We just pay our tithes, show up on the right day. That's enough. We got it covered. We'll just kind of skip over that. We don't like that page. Or does what Jesus say still apply? Are there times when we need to be strengthened? Are there times when our relationship isn't what it's supposed to be? I don't know about you, but the answer to those questions in my life is, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's an aspect of being a disciple of Christ that perhaps because we're too sophisticated, we have thought not applicable to us. 
I told you last week that one of my best friends, my mentor, uh, was engaged in a partial fast. He gave up all his electronic communication devices for four days. Some of you would find that harder than giving up the food for four days. I talked to him recently and said, how was it? He goes, it was the most painful experience I've ever endured. I go, what do you mean? He goes, have you ever had a root canal? I go, yeah, I have. I've had false teeth. I have root canals. He goes, you ever had it without Novocaine? I go, yeah, by the fact I had. He goes, twice as bad as that. I go, why was it so bad? He said, I became aware of my trust and dependency was on the technology instead of God. Oh, I can get that answer. I can deal with that. I can call somebody. His self-reliance through technology diverted his attention from the true source of his strength. The fast helped him realign his relationship with God. Precisely what a fast is designed to do. Our, fast, our fasted Lord. Our Lord fasted in time of temptation. He taught his disciples to do the same thing. He foretold of a time when his disciples would need to fast. And I think he saw the 21st century as clearly as he saw the 1st century. There are times when the combination of fasting and prayer is exactly what we need. The early church fasted. Paul regarded fasting as a mark of his ministry. And we've seen that prayer and fasting go hand in hand. Some of you are going, boy, I hope he ends soon and gets back to some regular sermons. It's okay. We will. But remember that quote from Ben Franklin I've told you more than once? The quote goes, a mind stretched by a new idea can never return to its original shape. One day, Jesus is going to say, hey, what do you think about this fasting thing? Well, I don't know. I never heard about it. Ain't going to work. You've heard about it. Now you've got to do something about it. And the Holy Spirit will tell you when, how, where, and why. But fasting is an aspect of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Closing hymn is hymn number 577. Five seventy seven in the heart of Jesus. Everyone stand, please. Five seven seven.
seated. You can sit if you want. Sorry. I follow a good leader. Sit down. Have a seat. No, no, she can't tell us that. Sit down. Um, let me share just one uh, request with you, as long as you're seated. <laughs> um, I have conflicting roles today. Uh, at 6 o'clock, I am supposed to be a pastor of the Auburn Church. At 5 o'clock, I need to be the father of my son. I can't do both equally well. If someone wants to be an MC for the night and introduce your violin playing expert at 6 o'clock, I would welcome that so that I can fulfill my primary role, which is to be the father of my son. Amen. So, let's pray. You can stay seated. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is clear, and that through your word we have an understanding of what our options are as your disciples. Lord, it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would speak to each of us, that we would reflect upon this aspect of being a child of yours and use it when appropriate. Satan would have us just to discard and ignore, but it is there so that our relationship with you can be strengthened. Send the Holy Spirit to speak to each of our hearts that we would respond to your word in a way that's pleasing to you, and that would prepare our hearts to see Jesus when he comes in the clouds. Is my prayer in his name. Amen. 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 